Uh, dear colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, with you, I'm Gabriela Kalkins, for English, and I have a great pleasure and a great privilege to introduce you to uh, outstanding speakers who are with us this morning, and uh, they are the towering figures in the area of Russian studies, political science, regional expertise, uh, people who are quite well known in Russia and beyond, people who have a very special reputation when it comes to their special touch on what's happening in the world in terms of present turbulence between Russia and the EU and at the same time some very important trajectories of politics and social, uh, social and political life in terms of identity, freedom. This is not accidental that I decided to to title the discussion, Identity and Freedom in Present Eastern Europe. We know quite well that history teaches us that it is, was no joke for Russia in the 19th century, where Russia is a being. Europe was quite an issue. It was a very hot topic, and we know that it has a very rich and turbulent tradition, which dates back to the Russian Slavophiles uh, and Zapadniki Westerners with people who debated the future of Russia in terms of its belonging, whether or not Russia was part of Europe, and we know that in Germany and France, and that was Russia in Europe, Russia in Europe by Nikolai Danilevsky, which means that this dilemma of Russia is a Europe, it dominated the discourse, the political discourse of Russia in the 19th century, and the paradox was that whereas people were not convinced that Russia was part of Europe, Russian culture spoke for itself. It has become an inescapable part of Europe. It has become one of the brightest things that Europe produced over the past two <coughs> centuries. The golden age of Russian poetry, the silver age, the 20th century, and the names of Russian composers and writers present something that makes any discussion about Russia's place in Europe meaningless. It is Europe. But when it comes to politics, many things remain highly debatable, difficult, turbulent, splitting the public opinion. That's why I would rely on the powers of expertise and knowledge of these wonderful people who are with us today. And they are Lydia Shevtsova, a political scientist, a sociologist, no. who worked with the Carnegie Institute for some time and now the Brookings okay. Institute. And Lydia Shevtsova, who is an expert on politics, public opinion, and with Lydia we have today Mr. Andrei Konkovsky, a polemicist, a great political analyst, a wonderful essayist. It's very difficult to exhaust somehow the, the, the characteristics of Andrei because he's a wonderful writer and a great analyst at one and the same time. Andrei Konkovsky, who has been with us with a forum of intellectuals in Vilnius for many, many years, I think from the very beginning. And Vladimir Karamurza, a journalist, a political commentator who worked for a long time with various projects, and Vladimir spent much of his time in the United States. Now he's back in Moscow, and I think that you are leading the project of Open Russia, coordinator of Open Russia project, and at the same time there is a very close link with the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. So this is to say that anyone who listens to Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty knows Vladimir quite well. So I'm really privileged and uh, really Andre and Vladimir, I cannot thank you enough for being with us today. For some obvious reasons, I cannot, I cannot uh, offer our discussion to be held in Russian, although I belong to those who love the Russian language and culture very much. But so it happens that we have uh, a very international audience today. And that's why we will hold this discussion in English. And I propose the following scenario. Each speaker will have 10, roughly 15 minutes for expose, and then we will have a discussion, the question and answer session. And needless to say, I have a great privilege of asking Lydia to start everything concerning identity, freedom, turbulences, dilemmas, and some ways out, if there are any of us. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I will stand if, yeah. if my friends will allow me. Yeah. First of all, it's a great pleasure, it's fun to be here and to see, you know, your faces and, well, the Lithuanian audience is one, apparently, from my experience in November, is one of the most attentive and exciting. And thank you, Leonidas, for inviting us. Well, I'm not sure that I'm an expert on the topic and I'm not sure that I have the answers to this problem. 
Uh, and I'm not sure that in 10 minutes I can give due to the Russia's landscape and all the challenges Russia and the space around Russia is facing. But I will try to uh, suggest a couple of theses and arguments in a way of rough strokes. So firstly, on the role of the benchmark, because definitely 2014 has become a benchmark in Russia's, in post-Soviet history, and maybe even in the global history. Why? Because Putin and the Kremlin, they have kicked over the global chessboard. Putin has ended a very complicated period of more than two decades, the post-Cold War era. He ended the period of ambiguity, normative fuzziness, the period of uncertainty and at the same time of hope. And apparently he opened a new chapter, a new life, a new epoch, and he forced us to be totally, you know, totally without any clue what kind of chapter it's going to be. And the world is still reeling with shock regarding of what is going, you know, to happen in the next couple of years. So what are the most important elements of this, you know, changing the trajectory, Russia's trajectory? Firstly, Firstly, Putin has changed the strategy of survival for Russia. Before 2014, you know, uh, the Russian system, the system of Russia's personalist power, survived on the basis of imitation. Russia imitated the Western institution. Russia pretended that it was totally cultural, as Leonid said, Leonid said, but it also could be politically part of Europe and part of the liberal civilization. And the spirit was used by the Russian elite and by the Kremlin for personal integration into the fabric of the Western society. Banking accounts, kids, you know, uh, uh, you, you know, in the Western countries, etc., etc. Not anymore. 2013, it was the moment of changing of the strategy. Not last year, but the year before. So, what is the new strategy of survival? This new strategy of survival definitely solves the issue of the new identity for Russia. The strategy is based on the idea of Russia is a unique state civilization. This is Putin's expression, and I would, I would agree with the Russian president. I would agree that Russia is a unique state civilization. Only I disagree with Putin on one issue. He believes that Russia cannot be changed. That Russia, you know, producing this tradition of subjugating the society to the authorities, to the one-man rule, will last forever and will reproduce this kind of uh, this kind of a system. I hope, I hope that well that he is wrong. But now the current strategy of survival is based on the following elements, the ingredients, the major the major elements of the new strategy is the following. Firstly, Russia has to contain the liberal democracy inside of Russia and outside of Russia. Secondly, Russia has to be the core, you know, the center of the new heresy within the post-Soviet space. And thirdly, Russia has, can you imagine, has traditional values that Russia is going to pursue, to expand globally. So this is the essence of the new Putin strategy of containment the West. Secondly, how does Ukraine fit this picture? Well, because in fact, the strategy of containment had been adopted by the Kremlin before Euromaidan, before the collapse of Yanukovych regime had happened. So, and Ukraine became for, for, for the Kremlin and for Russia a testing field, testing field to explore the new, uh, the new strategy of survival. Secondly, Ukraine factor, and this is really, the country became a very important civilizational and geopolitical factor. Ukraine beca became a testing field for other post-Soviet nations, for their ability to transform. 
And finally, Ukraine became a factor that apparently is a very important test. Test for the West and for Europe. Test for the ability to return to the normative project, to return to the you know, normative mission, to uh, you know, get out of the intellectual, analytical, and political paralysis that European Union and the West have been found you know, during the last at least 20 years or maybe 10 years. Thirdly, thirdly what, about, what about the at least short-term future? We've been arguing with my friends, with Andre and Volodya, and this is a typically, you know, Russian kind of conversation, Russian, Russian, you know, Russian debate. What is lying ahead of us? Whether the regime will collapse, whether the system is sustainable or durable, or whether everything will go down in flames and when. I would argue, this is my third point, that Russia, Russia civilization, Russia as a state, Russia as a system, Russia as the system of personalized power, of course, is not sustainable in the longer run. Maybe it's not sustainable even in the short term perspective, we don't know, because revolutions do happen unexpectedly, and countries do collapse unexpectedly. But what most possibly is the following option. Well, I, I, I would expect that maybe my friends would argue with me. Crisis is unavoidable. And Russia is only entering the first stage of crisis that definitely will be economical, social, systemic, civilizational, and geopolitical crisis. But we need to distinguish, and this is very important to distinguish between the Putin's leadership and Putin's political regime, the role of the team that perhaps includes how many? 50 people, 100 people, 200 people? The political regime and the political system of personalized power that has much broader political and social basis. Because even, you know, a lot of people that consider that view themselves as liberals in Russia would like to support the idea that Russia cannot be ruled as liberal democracy. Russia cannot have the identity of the liberal democratic country, rule of law country, but Russia has has to be ruled, you know, from the top, top-down government, one-man rule, because Russia is Russia, and Russia has to be subjugated to one man, otherwise it will be chaos, decadence. Well, and so I would argue that there is a possibility that the system of personalized power that has rather broad basis within the Russian society, the system still can be reproduced. How? By change of the regime. Putin will be kicked out, or as Andre, you know, has uh, defined it, uh, through the police, or uh, sorry, through the palace coup, yes? You've been writing about that. And the system will reproduce itself by, you know, changing the regime and moving to another one-man rule. This is a possibility. And what could be the, you know, much further perspective, much uh, more distant future for Russia? Could the regime change, solve the problem of the crisis? Of course not. Because the country and the system that cannot respond to the domestic and external challenges, the system that looks like a leftover of the 16th, maybe 19th century, the system cannot survive. It is losing its sustainability and durability. It cannot respond to the challenges of the norm, of the normal, of the normal, you know, of the normal uh, human's life. So this system is doomed. It will perish. The problem is that it faces at least two options. One option is a longer route, well, for indefinite time and then implosion of the state. Because Russia, as the combination of civilizationally, you know, uh, different segments that are not compatible. How come, for instance, the Northern Caucasus is compatible to the rest of Russia? So it's in, in, in non compatible. So the state will implode sooner or later. But either as a result of the rot and very long process of radial, of radial, you know, radial stagnation and degradation of the social and political fabric. Well, there is another option, the option that has much more possibility, possibility for a, for a birth and revival, collapse of the state and the system, and 
implosion and possibility for new transformation. In any case, what we know already and what the current experience of Russia and Russian system that is in the state of decay already for quite a long time, this experience has demonstrated it has no possibility to reform itself especially having, having included such ingredients as personalized power and merger with private property, as neo-imperialism, as militarization, as the core of the system. So sooner or later, we'll have this choice, rot without hope, or collapse, collapse, going down in flames and possibility of transformation. And my final, and my final argument is, well, of course, well, we have our own domestic internal logic. And we still, you know, we are in the situation when it's very difficult to predict what will happen next. Because in fact, Putin has unleashed the forces, firstly, that he cannot control, that the system cannot control, and the society still has no alternative to the regime that can control the strands and forces that are being formed now. Well, but at the same time, there is one community that has a very powerful impact on the situation within and outside Russia. This, uh, 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 this community is the community of Western liberal democracies. Until recently, it was European community, it was the West that played a very important role in, I would say, propping up of the Russian system, propping up and supporting, you know, the current system of personalized power. And a lot depends now whether Ukraine has awoken the West and liberal democracy, to what extent the West is now understanding that in order to answer the challenges that Putin already is Putin, uh, Putin is Putin, you know, uh, uh, on the agenda, the West has to find a new normative mission. The West has turned to, to its values. The West has, has to turn to new answers to the strategic questions that annexation of Crimea, that the war, Russian war in Ukraine has been posing. So now the role of the West is a very important geopolitical and civilizational factor. And a lot depends what the European leadership, what the Western leadership will be, you know, uh, uh, will be uh, uh, formulated as its future trajectory. Because as I've said, Russia today and the post-Soviet space is becoming perhaps one of the most important civilizational challenges of the 21st century. And the situation now is much more important from all points of view than 1991 when the Soviet un Union collapsed. So at this moment, I hope that I gave some hope, at least it wasn't that hopeless. I will end and I will give possibility my friends to continue. Yeah, thank you so much, Yulia. So we were making jokes before uh, before the forum that, well, all our discussions tend to be very pessimistic and grim. But I think that Yulia gave much hope and much bright prospect for the future. But in any case, I think that Andre has something to 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 to, to, to develop and to elaborate on. Andre Pankowski. Well, thank you, thank you, Leonidas. You presented me as a permanent participant of your intellectual club, my intellectual forum. And to prove this reputation, I follow up your, some of your historical remarks uh, about uh, ideological struggle inside Russian society between uh, Westerners and Slavophile, between Westerners and Eurasians uh, uh, for the latest uh, two or three centuries. I think that uh, the roots of this division in Russian uh, culture are are more are deeper in uh, uh, deeper in their nature, and uh, it's uh, very important to uh, tell about it in this place in uh, Lithuania and at that time in 2015. 800 years ago, in 1215, uh, simultaneously, it, it's uh, it's striking. Simultaneously, two great historical uh, document appeared in Britain, uh, Magna Charter, and uh, in uh, Mongolian Empire, Yasa, the collection of uh, wars of Chinggis Khan, 
exactly in the same year, uh, 100, uh, two, 12, 1215, two documents which shaped the uh, political development of all Eurasian uh, continent uh, uh, for, uh, for centuries. And in the same 13th century, uh, very important uh, event, maybe the most important in Russian uh, history, uh, happened. Uh, the Kievska Rus uh, was conquered and destroyed completely uh, by Mongols. And uh, since then, uh, two parallel Russian states uh, inherited Kievska Rus, uh, uh, two parallel states appeared for two or three centuries. One of them was uh, uh, Moscovia, a part of uh, uh, Jusy uh, part of uh, uh, Mongol Empire, uh, governed by Yasaos, and another part is the uh, Great Principality of Lithuania. At that time, this Great Principality was a multi-ethnic state, and the Russian were part of. Uh, in the Russian language was Russian, one of the languages of the state. The Russian was not conquered by Mongols. They were part of this uh, uh, multi-ethnic society and they continued uh, their existence inside European uh, civilization, uh, like, uh, like uh, their predecessor uh, to the predecessor Kievskarus. And since then, uh, in, in new, uh, in new implementation of, uh, of Russian state, these two cultures uh, coexist. There was descendant of uh, this Mongol Empire and descendant of that part of Russia uh, which existed, uh, existed uh, inside uh, this great principality uh, of Lithuania. So what is going now on the territory of the territory of Ukraine and Russia, which uh, 10 hundred years ago was uh, uh, the same state, one state, it was continuation of this ideological struggle uh, between two of these great documents. Uh, because uh, Chinggis Khan philosophy was reproduced both in Tsarist Russia, uh, in uh, uh, communist uh, uh, Soviet Union, and now in the uh, latest modification uh, of, uh, of Putin rule. And this division between two philosophies, it goes across Russia and across Ukraine uh, also. So it's a kind of, uh, of uh, civil war. In some sense, I, I am ready to, uh, to agree with uh, uh, one of the uh, formula of Putin propaganda, which I usually protest strongly, that there is no Ukraine, there is one, one, one great state. In, in some sense, we one great state of descendant of this uh, Kiev Skarus. The problem is that uh, Ukrainians are uh, more descendant of that European part uh, of Russia, and we are more descendant uh, uh, than uh, uh, the descendant of this uh, Mongol Empire. So it's very, very old and dramatic and dramatic uh, story. Uh, now about uh, current situation, uh, Lily delivered such full overview of the situation, so I don't want to uh, give another attempt to do it. I will be more, I try to answer more practical, more practical issue, uh, survival, survivability, even not this Russian system, but just Putin, uh, uh, Putin personal regime. Uh, well, uh, Putin articulated uh, this new philosophy of uh, uh, his regime during his uh, Crimean speech on March 18, uh, so fully, uh, so uh, openly and sincerely that uh, everybody was struck uh, by resemblance uh, with uh, Hitler's Sudeten speech in uh, uh, 38. I just repeat the main, uh, uh, the main uh, aspects of uh, new Putin philosophy. We are 
мы разделенный народ, we are divided nation, we should gather historical Russian words. This is all, all formula who uh, dro uh, were drivers of Nazi foreign policy uh, in Soros. Even terminology, national, national predation about for us, national traitors. It's not Soviet, not Russian terms. In Soviet Union, uh, we were uh, known враги народа, enemies of people. National traitors, national predator, it's specific, it's just a direct translation uh, for German. And all this concept of Russian, Russian русский мир, Russian world, which is spend and expand its analogy of this, uh, of this third rate. And uh, well, it was successful at the very beginning, because yes, uh, annexation of Crimea was uh, uh, greeted by, approved by, by majority, uh, majority of people, maybe because Crimea was a rather, a rather special case, uh, it was uh, part of the, half of the time of, during Soviet Union era, it was part of Russian Federation, half of the time of uh, Ukrainian. But uh, I don't think that all this philosophy uh, of Ruski Mir uh, were accepted uh, by, by the public, neither by society nor uh, by elite. Because uh, uh, the success of dictators with such philosophy uh, depends on dynamics. He should deliver. He should deliver successes or, or appearance of success. Well, let's return to the uh, German, uh, German uh, history of searches. Uh, in 1933, Hitler was not supported by majority of German people. He, he uh, won election in January, getting about uh, well 40 percent of population, and uh, uh, was made by chancellor's or coalition with some rather. By 1939, by the was enthusiastically supported almost, almost because he delivered rain region, he delivered. Uh, uh, Sudetian continued after success uh, uh, by success. Uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, uh, interesting that uh, in short, there were several attempts of military reports against Hitler because the uh, generals understood uh, the craziness of this, uh, this policy. And each time when they were ready to overthrow Hitler, uh, West made some, uh, Western powers, France, uh, Britain made some uh, concession and uh, Hitler was uh, against uh, popular. Unfortunately, the Putin, he couldn't repeat uh, this success. In this case, in famous speech, uh, he not simply uh, formulated this philosophy of uh, Ruski Mir. He indicated the very practical next step after Crimea, no Russia, a uh, region uh, of, uh, of Ukraine. Uh, he, and it was uh, uh, tremendous. Devastating fail for him. What is uh, left from this Novorossia uh, project now? The so-called uh, Lugandonia, uh, which he is trying uh, to push back uh, into, in, in, into Ukraine. The dictator have no right uh, to fail. This is uh, this is uh, all of uh, of personal regime, and Putin failed. He failed during uh, uh, 2014 catastrophically, uh, at least, and uh, I, it will be my, my, uh, my last point, the four tremendous failures of uh, Putin in 1914, uncomparable with uh, uh, his uh, previous experience of dictator. Uh, he began all this campaign uh, against Ukraine just to prevent European vector of Ukrainian development. Now its European vector is irreversible. Uh, he may destroy Ukraine after all by nuclear weapon if you want, but in minds, in the hearts of Ukrainian, it's, uh, it's already an uh, uh, irreversible choice. Uh, the second, I already mentioned this uh, failure with uh, uh, Navarrosia. The third, it, comes, it uh, has very much to do with both republics. He's a nuclear blackmail. Uh, all the year, uh, he bullied and blackmailed uh, West with uh, using of uh, nuclear weapon. Uh, his, well, 
you understand that this philosophy, even the modest implementation uh, of the philosophy of uh, Ruski Mir, uh, the gathering of so-called historical Russian lands, uh, demanded a changing of borders uh, at least uh, two NATO member states, uh, Latvia and Estonia, which have uh, considerable uh, ethnic Russian memory. How could he, uh, how he, could he plan to, to, to fight uh, West when economic might, conventional army might of NATO ten times more uh, than uh, the Russian Federation. Only by uh, by Bergmanning with uh, nuclear weapon. His his uh, uh, calculation was to scare off the United States and uh, and uh, NATO from supporting uh, this country and uh, to send the uh, polite green uh, men and uh, uh, and. Uh, West with nuclear weapons uh, um, prevent the intervention. But he failed. Uh, according to NATO summit in May, already uh, several hundred uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, NATO, uh, NATO soldiers, uh, including American side, in territory of Estonia and Latvia. You say that 100 American uh, soldiers uh, is nothing. Yes, it's nothing in purely military, but psychologically and politically, it changed everything. It means that when uh, so-called uh, polite green men appear uh, there, uh, Russian Federation automatically involves itself in full-scale confrontation uh, with the uh, United States, which certainly uh, no leader uh, in Russia, uh, even so crazy uh, as Putin, will never, will never risk. Uh, Putin wants to uh, put before West the classical uh, question of Sotis. Are you ready to die, to die for Danzig? Are you ready to die for Narva? And now, NATO, by deploying uh, American soldiers there, turned this uh, question back to him. Mr. Putin, are you ready to die uh, to Narva? And he is not ready to die. Uh, the wealthiest person in the world who is uh, uh, whose wealth is uh, estimated to be 150 billion dollars are not, uh, are not ready for die for Narva or any other, other piece of land. And final, first uh, uh, devastating uh, uh, failure is its, uh, its uh, state of Russian economy. Now, it's going down and down, and uh, even we, opponents of uh, Putin regime, who criticize uh, his kleptocracy, uh, importance of his uh, economic system, we, uh, under we didn't uh, uh, understand how vulnerable Russia economy is. Uh, because uh, uh, Western, Western uh, sanctions so far are rather mild. Uh, the sanctions against uh, Iran, for example, for the latest two years were uh, much tougher. And it's already uh, putting uh, uh, Russian economy to shampoo. So dictator uh, is failure of all direction. And it's very, uh, very difficult uh, situation for dictator. You talked uh, about this in dictator system. Uh, uh, the power uh, is not the issue of power is not decided on election. It's decided among uh, uh, power of the uh, dictator depends on loyalty of loyalty 100 person maximum uh, around him. And believe me. Uh, I interacting with some of the person. They are panic now. They are panic because uh, they are losing their wealth. All of them depend completely on the life from the West. They have enormous wealth uh, in the West, and the capitalization of, of this property already getting down from billionaires. And they are, they, today they are becoming multimillionaires, and, uh, and so on. Uh, so, but there are two. Uh, they are cowards, they are not ready uh, to stand up to dictate yet, but uh, this situation uh, is getting uh, more and more, more and more gloomy. For, uh, I agree with, uh, with uh, Lily and what I, I, I told myself about these roots of this authoritarian, uh, authoritarian uh, uh, tendency. 
tendons in, 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 in Russian politics are very deep and uh, I don't want to uh, speculate now about uh, evolution of Russian system of power uh, as a whole. But about person of Mr. Putin, I dare to say that uh, this uh, his uh, days uh, of uh, a dictator are numbers. This certainly not a matter of yes. Uh, my estimation is that it's it's a matter of months. If if West at least sustain at this level of sanction uh, which uh, uh, he, it holds now. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Andrei. And now the floor is famous. <coughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to speak uh, uh, together with Lily and Andre. Uh, and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be on the panel. Thank you, Lily, for the invitation. And thank you all for being here. Uh, of course, we hold this discussion as uh, uh, Lithuania marks the 24th anniversary of the uh, tragic days of January 1991, uh, when uh, Mikhail Gorbachev sent tanks uh, into Vilnius to crash uh, or attempt to crash the, uh, the uh, Lithuanian independence movement. And I think this is a, an opportune moment to remind ourselves of what may seem very improbable today, uh, the fact that uh, at that time, Lithuania and the Baltic states in general, the pro-independence movements in the Baltic states, probably had no greater ally than Russia and her leader. Because on the very day when uh, Gorbachev sent tanks uh, here in Vilnius, um, Boris Yeltsin, who was then the Speaker of the Russian Parliament and de facto head of state of the Russian Republic, uh, publicly and unequivocally came out in support of the self-determination uh, and independence of the Baltic states and actually flew into Tallinn, uh, Estonia, despite the advice of even many of his friends who considered it a crazy move, to sign mutual uh, support agreements with the leaders or representatives of all the three Baltic nations um, uh, and uh, appealed, publicly appealed to Soviet troops stationed in the Baltic states to reject and to refuse to follow uh, orders to shoot down peaceful demonstrators. And um, he had to leave uh, uh, Tallinn by car rather than plane because he received some advice that the KGB may try to shoot down the plane he was flying back in, so probably that was, that was well, well founded. Uh, President Landsberg is a legendary figure here in, in Lithuania, once said that uh, Boris Yeltsin was a true friend of Lithuania and an intelligent friend of Lithuania. I think it's important to remember that um, there are different periods in Russian history and there are periods when Russia was not just culturally but also politically and socially part of Europe and I think the early 90s was, was certainly that period of time. And then of course later that year in July 1991, Yeltsin and Landsberg signed the uh, agreement of mutual cooperation uh, in which for the first time uh, the Russian president acknowledged what the Soviet leadership had been denying for decades. And, and by the way, that Putin's regime is now once again denying, despite the historical facts, that the annexation, Stalin's annexation of the Baltic states uh, in 1940 was, uh, was a forced annexation. It was illegal. It wasn't a voluntary uh, merger, as, as Putin's foreign ministry now is once again trying to claim. Uh, of course, we're miles away now uh, in Russia from where we were in the early 90s. And, uh, the, uh, you know, the legacy of that time was simultaneously destroyed both at home, domestically, uh, and in terms of foreign policy. And I think it's, it's also important to acknowledge what many uh, leaders in the West uh, either failed to acknowledge or pretended that they didn't notice the, the, the interlink, that there is, there is a direct connection between domestic repression and external aggression. And that with time, um, any repressive regime inevitably turns uh, outward. And there's, there's absolutely no reason uh, to expect a system that represses its own citizens uh, and breaks its own laws and its own constitution to somehow respect international law and respect uh, its, its, the sovereignty of its neighbors. And I think an uncharitable observer would even suggest that the, uh, you know, the aggressive behavior of Putin's regime now is the price the Western leaders are paying for having turned a blind eye year after year after year uh, when Putin's regime shut down independent media, jailed and repressed opponents, uh, fixed elections, be, uh, beat up peaceful demonstrators on the streets of Moscow and so on and so forth. These things are very much interlinked. Um, and, and I also think, and this, this is an arguable point, and I'm not sure if my colleagues would agree uh, or not with me on this, but um, I believe that the, uh, what's happening in Ukraine and the aggression of the Putin regime against Ukraine primarily has domestic motivations. 
Uh, in my point of view, it's not uh, chiefly about the uh, you know, neo-Soviet or neo-imperial plans to recreate some sort of sphere of influence, although, of course, that would be an added benefit for the, for the Putin regime. It fits into their ideology very well, but um, I think the chief motivation of Mr. Putin after the success of the Maidan in Kiev was to prevent the success of a Maidan in Moscow, so to speak, and to stop this quote-unquote dangerous example from spreading. Because frankly, the image of a corrupt authoritarian leader hastily fleeing his country in a helicopter while hundreds of thousands of people stood protesting in, in, in the main square of the capital, that frankly was too uncomfortable for him. That was too close to home. And so once the Ukrainian revolution was successful, uh, we saw an unbelievable uptick uh, in, the, in the propaganda against, uh, to, to trying to discredit Ukraine, uh, the West in general, the ideas of democracy. This, what we've seen, the psychological attack we're seeing uh, on, on, on Russian television screens every single day, all those of us who live, uh, uh, all three of us who live in Moscow, it's, it's some, I mean, we don't watch it, but we know what it is. It's, it's simply unbelievable, even compared to, uh, to the previous 14 years of Putin's rule. The last year has been something Yes. I mean, I think a, a, a prominent journalist who um, has worked in Soviet television and then in Russian television, and now he's, 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 a, he's an exiled journalist in Ukraine, but he said that the uh, propaganda on television in Russia today is worse than it was in, in the Soviet times. Because the, the, he said that back then, the, 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 the government TV took facts and twisted them to suit their own names. Now they're inventing facts. You know, like, like the Ukrainian army crucifying a child in, in, in eastern Ukraine. Uh, this simply, 90% of what they're saying are actually lies. And they're showing pictures from, footage from Syria you know, to, to illustrate what's happening in Ukraine, so on and so forth. So it, it has absolutely no bearing um, on reality at all. So uh, for me, in my point of view, this, this whole ag aggression uh, and the imperial rhetoric and the propaganda uh, is, is a classic authoritarian ploy. First of all, to, to discredit the example of the Ukrainian Maidan, and then, of course, to try to divert people's attention from the, from the corruption, from the failing economy at home, and, 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 and frankly, with, from middle-class fatigue with a, a regime that's been in place uh, for 15 years now. I think it's, also, it's important to, to just you know, put things in, in, in perspective here. The next presidential election that we have scheduled is, is going to be in March 2018. It's a different question when it will be, and I think I agree with, with my colleague Andrei Piankowski that I don't, frankly, I also don't believe that will last until 2018. But let's say that's when the next presidential election happens, or so-called election. The people who will vote in that election for the first time would have been born under Vladimir Putin. This is just to put things in context of how long this regime has been in power. They're almost up to Brezhnev's longevity now. He was in power for 18 years. He's now in power for, for 15. Uh, but I don't want to finish on this uh, pessimistic note because I'm actually uh, also feeling pretty optimistic like, like my colleagues here. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about a different Russia that also exists, and that exists uh, right now, even under this current regime. Because uh, it's also important to, and sometimes Western commentators and journalists miss this distinction. It's like, you know, back in the, back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s, there were these bizarre statements in, in Western newspapers that, you know, the, the Russian troops invaded Afghanistan and Soviet academician Sakharov protested against it, you know, this mixing of terms. And too often now in Western media we hear, you know, the term Russia intertwined for, for, for what really is a uh, Putin regime. They are two different things. Russia and Putin regime are not one in the same. It's, it's an obvious point, but sometimes it needs uh, restating. Um, and there is even to, even if we take the official opinion polls, which I think are meaningless. In, you know, when you have total propaganda, you don't really have public opinion. But even if we take the official opinion polls, even even if we take official election results, even if we judge just just by these figures, there are millions of people in Russia today who, who believe in a democratic and European future for our country. Um, in the so-called presidential election in 2012, uh, even according to the official results, Putin failed to reach even the 50% mark in Moscow, in Kaliningrad, in Vladivostok, in Omsk, in Vladimir, in other large towns and cities across the country. Of course, we've seen, as, as you all know, uh, from late 2011, we've seen tens of thousands of people come out to the streets to protest against the election fraud and the corruption and the repression uh, and the hypocrisy of this regime. These, these are the largest demonstrations, uh, pro-democracy demonstrations we've had since since August 1991. Uh, just over a year ago, in the Moscow mayoral election, again, even according to their, their own official results, almost 30% uh, of voters supported opposition leader Alexei Navalny, who is now under, under house arrest. 
uh, and of course, just recently in, in the autumn of 2014, uh, between 50 and 70,000 people took, play, uh, took part in, a, in an anti-war march through downtown Moscow against Putin's aggression in Ukraine, against Putin's war in Ukraine. Uh, 50 to 60,000 people marching from Pushkin Square to, to Academician Sakharov Avenue, chanting peace to Ukraine, freedom to Russia. And I remember we were, uh, I was walking uh, among the, the, the first people in that, in that demonstration, and when we already reached uh, Sadovek, I saw where Academician Sakharov Avenue is, two or three miles back, all the, all the garden ring was filled with people, and people were still lining up to go through metal detectors back in Pushkin Square. Uh, I mean, of course, the Moscow police said there were 100 people or something attending. That's what they usually do. Um, but this was th this was really one of the biggest uh, demonstrations of recent years. And, and the Levada Center opinion poll, which was taken just after it, showed that nearly one in three uh, Russian citizens supported the aims of the of the anti-war protesters. So so this leaves nothing, uh, you know, in the Kremlin propaganda myth that uh, the only people who oppose Putin and his regime are a handful of uh, national traitors, as Andrei said. And that's an alpha hatter. This is. You know, if, if we're talking even in, in, this, in these conditions, about one in three people supporting those demonstrators who dared to come out, that's, that's a pretty impressive figure, I would suggest. Because today was supposed to be another big protest day. Today, January the, the 15th, uh, was the original date uh, for the court verdict in the case of Alexei Navalny. Uh, and uh, the, the opposition and civil society groups planned a big mass protest in Moscow today. And within days of the initiative being announced, Tens of thousands of people joined the online groups and initiative groups to, to announce that they would be coming to attend this protest rally. Uh, and so the regime had to react, and they hastily, and I should add illegally, uh, brought the verdict date forward uh, to the 30th of December. They announced it on the 29th of December. So not only is this the day before New Year's Eve, which is the main holiday in Russia, where everybody is either outside of Moscow already or you know, being busy preparing for the, for the New Year, but also they only left people 24 hours to do something to organize. But still, there were thousands of people who came to protest on Manezhna Square on the 30th of December. And uh, uh, mm. frankly, the center of Moscow looks like an, an occupied war zone at that time. Uh, all the space around Manezhna and Antwerskaya and Akhotnirat was filled with, uh, with reinforced military trucks, with the interior ministry uh, troops, with Amon riot police. Um, frankly, this does not look like the behavior of a government that has 80%, as they claim, approval of the polls. This looks like a behavior of a regime mortally afraid to call its own people. I remember the same scene, by the way, the night after Putin's so-called election in 2012, um, when we also had held a mass protest on Pushkin Square, and the whole of Tverskaya Street looked again like a war zone uh, under occupation. You had troops, you had trucks, you had you had these people in military gear. You had hundreds of buses prepared to you know to, to uh, place arrested demonstrators and to, to be uh, uh, led away to prison. Again, this does not look like a behavior of a legitimate democratically elected or popular popularly supported government as they claim they are. And this is not just for protest rallies. For instance, o Open Russia, the, the movement that, that I have the honor of representing, we're now um, uh, beginning to hold uh, discussions, panel discussions, conferences, roundtables, much as much like this one here, uh, around the country. Because uh, you remember, Lenin, as Boris Grislov, the former Speaker of the Duma, once famously said that Parliament is not a place for discussion, right? And this, this is not, unfortunately, just Parliament. Nowhere is a place for discussion in Putin's mind in Russia. And this, this public space for just really for just honest conversations about the country and its future is being squeezed and pushed and, and increasingly destroyed, especially if you go outside of Moscow and St. Petersburg. So we're trying to compensate that and keep this public space open. So we're holding these uh, open discussion events around the country. And every time we hold these events, uh, we have people from the FSB, from the emergencies ministry, from the riot police. Uh, they say the building is, you know, there's a bomb in the building. They switch off internet. They switch off lights. Would a government that had 80% approval will be so afraid of its own citizens just holding free discussions? I frankly do not think so. Um, and I think uh, this year, uh, Lilia said that 2014 was a turning point in terms of the regime's behavior, and I fully agree with this. And I think this year that we just entered, 2015 could be another turning point in that we could have, for the first time since the late 80s and early 90s, we could have again that combination that proved, in fact, to be the death formula of the Soviet regime, the joining of the political protest against the dictatorship with the social and economic protest against the failing economy and, and the crashing down living standards, which, which, which we are already seeing, as, as my colleagues have mentioned. 
so I think I'll, I, will, I will leave it there, and, and uh, I think that's, that this, this may be a year to watch uh, what was going to happen in Russia. Um, and uh, I think we all look forward to the discussion and questions from the audience. And thank you again for holding us. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. So I can thank you. One yeah. short remark. Absolutely. Remark. Uh, following up uh, uh, Vladimir's um, points about Putin regime oppression in our fighter, among uh, us, one of the heroes of uh, our fight against oppression is President uh, Daniel Konstantinov. Uh, he uh, spent uh, uh, two years uh, in prison on, uh, on false uh, on false charges uh, and uh, was freed uh, recently under 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 pressure of uh, of, uh, of society. And uh, I want to tell that we have a different political philosophy with Daniel. I'm Russian liberal. He is uh, a leader of one Russian uh, nationalist organization, and we both uh, fight. Putin regime because Putin's policies is anti-national and uh, anti-liberal. And we are fighting uh, not for rule of uh, one of the parties, we are fighting just for creating uh, a new system when we, as Vavode put it, will settle our ideological difference in free discussion uh, in, uh, in free parliament. So uh, the unity of uh, uh, different school of political thought, liberal, leftist and national, is a very, very important uh, factor for overcoming this uh, kleptocratic regime, which has no ideology, no, uh, no ideology at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I cannot thank you enough for wonderful statements and great expositions. And for now, I propose that we have the question and answer session. So we have roughly around 20 minutes for that because our our speakers will have to rush to another forum. So and we have a broad audience ranging from our and board members to our students, colleagues. Uh, and that's why I would expect some comments or questions, but first, who would like to um, ask a question? So then we'll have some time for discussion. Yeah, questions. Okay. I'm a publicist. My name is Vladimir. Okay, I'll tell you. Uh, I have two short questions. One is for uh, Madam Shepsova, and the other is for Mr. Nikowski. Uh, uh, do you think that in case of a crisis in Russia and uh, the, cr the crisis of the Putin regime, as you put it, and in case that Putin is ousted, there might come, okay, so to say, the leader, or say the Fuhrer, you understand what I mean? Uh, whose appearance will be absolutely disastrous, not only for Russia, but for the entire world. And another question is for Andrei Yankovsky. Uh, what, uh, what are the registered official proofs of Putin's intentions to invade Latvia or Estonia? Uh, if I may, uh, my short answer to your, to your question is definitely the possibility of the Paris coup in this situation that we have in Russia is a, 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 a huge probability. It's a very viable option if we look at the logic of this type of regimes and especially at the situation when they have erased all political forces that could create an alternative. Whether another one-man rule will be much more nationalistic, much more totalitarian, much more unpleasant, disastrous, etc. Quite a possibility. But the longer Putin stays, you know, uh, the probability of a much more disastrous scenario increases. And in any case, who has the possibility to take over the financial, repressive, and other means of control? Those Praetorians who control already the mechanisms. So we can expect that the next regime will be repressive and Praetorian. Yeah. Well, dictators never announce formally their plan to invade this or that state. For example, uh, 
Putin's regime uh, never announced his plan to annex Crim or, uh, or invade uh, eastern Ukraine before the February uh, 2015. What I quote and refer to is Putin's speech, very important speech, on March 18, which gives philosophical foundation for invading any country of uh, post-Soviet space, and not only post-Soviet space. Uh, with his concept of disunited uh, uh, nation and gathering of historical Russian land, Putin openly claimed his right, and not only right, but his sacred duty to protect <coughs> Uh, not citizen of Russia, but to protect ethnic Russians, descendants of citizen of uh, Soviet Union, and even in some interpretation, descending of citizen of Russian Empire. So, as I put it, like uh, Mr. Hmm? Like Mr. Yeah. So, uh, so. Even the mildest uh, in, uh, implementation uh, of this doctrine uh, certainly demands uh, uh, demands uh, uh, sending uh, green uh, in success of Novorossiya. Believe, uh, believe me, in this case of success of Novorossiya, uh, both republics uh, uh, were, uh, were uh, the next. But it's not all. Uh, Putin and his uh, propaganda also. Uh, also uh, introduce the concept of so-called hybrid war. And hybrid war involves uh, a set of uh, combination of regular forces, irregular forces, informational war, psychological war, cyber attack, and so on. And believe me, this hybrid war against both republics is already going on, including the Svenja Republic. Uh, on daily basis, there are intrusion in air, air space uh, of both republics, uh, the Estonian uh, uh, the Estonian officer was abducted, uh, uh, the Red Wing ship was abduct abducted, uh, Russian propaganda, including uh, uh, foreign ministry, uh, made statement after statement about persecution of Russians, uh, Russian citizens uh, in, uh, in both republics. All these elements, so this hybrid war against both republic uh, uh, is already going on. Yeah. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. I'm delighted to see you here today. Uh, I have also two questions. First, to uh, I don't know whoever can answer. Second, very brief for all of you. Uh, uh, I read a, a, an interview with one Russian, actually a pro Kremlin uh, um, um, a person. Uh, I can't, unfortunately, I can't recall his name. I tried to Google it, but. Uh, uh, what he said that uh, uh, Putin actually tried to be a liberal, but uh, after he became president, but then he saw that uh, the society does not fit to democracy, it's a society of subordinates. So actually, he failed because of the society. That's not my fault. Um, second question that I gave to uh, another great uh, Russian. Uh, uh, person, uh, Elena Panfilova, maybe you know her, she recently visited Lithuania, she is the head of Transparency International uh, Moscow uh, Russian branch. What I asked her, uh, and I'm not a Russian agent, uh, uh, aren't you afraid for your own personal security? Uh, so from the second question comes this uh, annex that maybe there is a, some sort of uh, a uh, glass ceiling for opposition that you are allowed, uh, which you cannot cross until you are destroyed physically. Well, uh, thanks for the for the question, especially the first one. That's that's a really fundamental one, and I think that's the that's the excuse 
that all those apologists of, the, of this regime and, and all the other authoritarian regimes like it use, not just for Russia, but for Russia particularly. And I find this, um, I find this argument really insulting. Uh, whenever people, Kremlin apologists, try to say it, I think you know the, the Kremlin likes to accuse Western politicians of Russophobia, but I think there's nothing more Russophobic than, for instance, Dmitry Medvedev, who is now prime minister, who said that uh, for, uh, he said publicly once that parliamentary democracy would be a disaster for Russia. I think that's a Russophobic statement. Or the current Ministry of Culture, which published an official doctrine last year uh, under the title "Russia is not Europe." I think that's insulting and Russophobic. And um, I see no major difference between us and any other Eastern or Central European nation. And there's no reason, you know, why we should be somehow unsuited to something that works in all these other countries around us, including Slavic countries, including Christian Orthodox countries. And in terms of Russia itself. Um, I think uh, the best example would be just to use the, the, the very empiric, very practical one. Unfortunately, we didn't have many free elections in our country in our history, but those times we did have free competitive elections. Every single time the forces of authoritarianism lost and the forces of democracy won. Every single time. 1906, the election to the very first Russian parliament, the State Duma. Uh, the Constitutional Democratic Party won a, a, a big plurality of the, of the seats while the candidates from the, from the extreme right union of Russian people, the pro-Zarist, the pro-absolutist candidate, didn't win any seat at all. They had zero. Sure, mm -hmm. yeah. In 1917, in fact, in 1907, the government had to change the franchise to restrict the franchise to get some of its people in, because when the franchise was wider, they just couldn't do anything. In 1917, we had the election to the Constituent Assembly in November, which was already after the Bolsheviks seized power by force in the coup d'etat. And they lost that election. They, they got 25% against 60% for the SR party, which was a left-wing uh, party representing peasants, which wanted a democratic federal republic of Russia, as opposed to a dictatorship of the proletariat. Of course, the assembly was dispersed by force, and that followed what followed was four years of civil war after that. In 91, uh, the first ever direct presidential election we had, uh, Boris Yeltsin, who was the candidate of the democratic opposition, received 57%, whereas former Soviet Premier Nikolai Rishkov, who was the official nominee of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which was then the ruling party, received 17%. So every single time the Russian people had any say in, in what they want, they chose the forces of democracy over the forces of anti-democracy. So whenever you know, people try to, to say that you know, we're unsuited or we're unworthy or all the rest of it, I think this is just a classic. Uh, this is actually this is similar to the same argument that also the Kremlin regime uses often, that may, maybe we're bad, but what will come after us or the alternatives are, are much worse. So this is, these are kind of the arguments or quote unquote arguments of the same order for me. I think they're absolutely, uh, they're not grounded in any, any facts, they're not grounded in reality. These are excuses offered by the authoritarian regime to explain their own you know, position in power. Either the people are bad or the alternatives are bad. Therefore, we have to be in power. I think this is a pathetic excuse for an argument, frankly. So thanks very much for bringing that question. Maybe I will just yeah. add a couple of words. Yeah. You know, uh, one can trust the polls or one cannot trust the polls, but the rest is, you know, conclusion based on our intuition. According to the service during the last two decades, there are approximately between 15 and 19 percent of the Russian population who would support liberal democratic ideas, rule of law, and etc. But approximately 60, 65 percent of the Russian respondents would support the rule of law system and the state if this is offered to them. So they are not active fighters for that, but if the elite is ready to offer them, they will support and accept. So approximately around 25, 30% are really supporters of this traditional archaic, you know, and a, a, a absolutely archaic Russia. Well, this is not a large segment of the society. Andrew. Well, about uh, personal security, well, there is no uh, repression of such magnitude as in Stalin regime or Hitler regime. When I compared uh, Putin regime uh, with Hitler, I first of all meant uh, foreign policy, which is uh, absolutely uh, the same. But it doesn't mean that there is no repression. There are hundreds of uh, uh, political uh, prisoners of a country. Uh, especially in the regions when they are arrested by uh, local uh, authorities. Uh, uh, well, I already talked about 
about uh, Daniela Konstantinov. And now the, our friend Ivan Chutrin, the former uh, executive director of Solidarity Movement. Uh, he fled the country two years ago, one day before he would be arrested uh, and charged with organizing seminars in Lithuania, by the way. The seminars uh, on uh, instrument of fortune collection. Very, very in innocent, uh, innocent activity supported by, by European Union. Uh, uh, personally, I, I am a rather special case because I was, uh, I was the first person charged with extremism in 2007 uh, on, on new version of uh, war against extremists. And my process lasted for two years and in 2009 I was acquitted. I was uh, fully acquitted. It was uh, one of the uh, small victories uh, uh, of freedom uh, of speech in my country. And you know, in some sense, in some case, I am. This was a kind of immunization for me because it would be too embarrassing, maybe, for authority uh, to charge me uh, for the for the second uh, uh, day running, uh, for the second time running. But no institution prevents uh, uh, Putin from, from arresting uh, thousands of people tomorrow. Uh, by the way, it's well known that uh, there are lists uh, of potential uh, national traitors in uh, FSB. There are uh, a list of 3,000 persons uh, only in Moscow and St. Petersburg, uh, which according to the, this FSB document should be arrested to prevent mass streets disorders. So uh, uh, during uh, each uh, demonstration which uh, uh, regime perceives as dangerous for him, uh, he, he can go he can go to repression. Uh, this will not help it. It's another, another story, but uh, it doesn't uh, change the fact that uh, uh, there is no rule of law in my country and any person could be arrested at uh, any moment. So, this will be the very, very final question because we will... Yes, yes. 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 So, yes. The problem is from the dead time, so my question would be economical. Uh, how do you assess the uh, ongoing uh, initiative of the Eurasian Union and uh, what, how, how do you see the prospects of it to expand? Will it uh, disintegrate or will Russia eventually join the European Union? <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, Andrew wants to respond it. Well, I would recommend you to see a video of press conference of uh, Lukashenko and uh, uh, Putin on uh, the latest uh, session of Eurasian Union in Moscow. They look at each other uh, with uh, hatred. Uh, not considered uh, hatred. And one of the Putin plans uh, of uh, expanding uh, Russian uh, vote uh, in 2005 uh, uh, is uh, a plot to remove uh, Lukashenko. And uh, what, uh, what Russian Union, what custom union can we talk now when Lukashenko uh, introduced uh, uh, Custom posts on all uh, Russian, uh, Russian, Belarusian uh, border. It's uh, uh, it's a failure, a complete failure, as every uh, project of reunification on post-Soviet space. Because motivation of participants were not only different; they were quite opposite. The uh, motivation of Moscow was. Uh, to create some kind of Soviet Union light to overcome uh, what Putin uh, formulated as the greatest uh, geopolitical catastrophe of uh, 20th century. And for uh, dictators like Lukashenko, Nazarbayev and others, uh, it was just uh, to attempt to get uh, um, much money uh, from uh, Russia Lukashenko, getting a lot of uh, subsidies uh, until recently uh, from uh, Russian uh, budget. So uh, forget about this uh, project of... Uh, of <laughs> yeah. and, and European Union? Hmm? And joining European Union, do you see any prospects? Oh, uh, well, Russia. Uh, you, you, for Russia? Yes. Uh, not during my life. <laughs> 
even even if Putin uh, would be over, uh, overthrown tomorrow, because the state of our economy, the state of our of our institution is such after uh, 20 years. Uh, uh, Authoritarian rule. I am not idealizing, by the way, Yeltsin time. Volodya was absolutely right when uh, she, he talked about uh, Yeltsin gravity in '91, and Yeltsin did uh, a lot to help uh, both republics. Uh, but the same person, Yeltsin, in, in 1999, uh, gave power to a KGB officer. It was uh, already a different, uh, a different personality, but uh, it's it's another story which would take us uh, in our more discussions. Just one, one word, one uh, sentence. Uh, talking about Eurasian Union, there is no economic rationality in the Eurasian Union for any country, uh, neither for uh, Armenia that probably will join it, Kyrgyzstan that is standing in a queue, with the exception of Belarus. Belarus is getting more than two billion subsidies annually. Kazakhstan and Russia are losing tremendously. For them, it's strictly a political project. On the question of, on your question about the European Union, I know a lot of people laugh, but I just want to say a couple of facts. The Deutsche during Welle, during the his wife. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, my children maybe, but uh, the Deutsche Welle, the German news service, has been doing these po annual polls, I think, once every two years. Uh, and it found consistently that every time a majority of Russians under the age of 35 favor eventual entry into the European Union. So I don't think it's, it's such a laughing matter. I mean, we are a European nation. Once the Copenhagen criteria met, I think that's the main issue. It's not even economic. It's a question of rule of law, uh, democratic institutions. And of course, before that, it's impossible. But once we do fulfill these criteria, and nobody can tell what time you know, this can take. But in principle, I see absolutely no problem with it. it, it this EU membership is, is open to any European nation. We are a European nation, so that, that shouldn't present any problems in, in principle. I think it, 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 it could happen eventually. I, I think it would be a positive development. Um, and just a very side, one side point I wanted to make regarding what Andre said. Some of you may think that Andre's um, uh, comparison between Putin and Hitler is, is controversial, but in fact that's a comparison embraced by the Kremlin people themselves. Migranian. We have this uh, political I forgot about so tell, tell them his Andrei Migranian, who, was, who received medals from Putin, has been a member of the public chamber under Putin, appointed by him. He had an article in his Vestia last year, which is the main Putinist newspaper where he developed the concept of the good Hitler and the bad Hitler. And prior to 1938, according to Migranian, or 39 even, prior to 1939, Hitler was a fine. He was the gatherer of German lands, he was his great leader. Incidentally, this was, this was already, you know, the Nuremberg laws have happened, Kristall Nights have happened, all the, there were hundreds of political prisoners, but he was okay, he was good. And only after 1939, Hitler wasn't so good anymore. That's, that's the official, or, or quasi-official Kremlin endorsed line. So this is not Andre being a radical revolutionist suggesting this comparison. This is a Kremlin endorsed comparison. So I think it's a pretty valid point to refer to. Yeah, yeah. And this is comment of Koloshe Hitler. The good Hitler, right. The, the, very, the very short one. It is to be very final. Uh, and I'm not sure if there is a correct or wrong answer to it, but I was wondering, you know, during all those years that uh, uh, Putin was in power together with his crew, uh, as I feel that if uh, want to be rational, it had a chance of restructuring the economy and uh, still um, remaining in power. Uh, just for example, going China way or, or similar way. Uh, do you think uh, there is a rational reason why it hasn't gone this way, or is this absolutely, uh, well, some selfish and some uh, his personal reason why he went this way, not a uh, liberal way, which would still perhaps give him a chance to remain in power for longer than expected? Yep. Well, first of all, if he's gone the, the liberal democratic way, we have a term limit in our constitution, so he shouldn't have been there after 2008, full stop, whatever happened. Uh, that's just, just the most obvious point. But frankly, I think this, this may sound you know, very simplistic in a way, but I personally think that's, that's a really big valid reason. This is a guy from the Soviet KGB, and that's not a trivial thing. What was he taught all his life? He was taught how to how to, how to lie. So it's more personal. How, of course. That's, I mean, it's not just personal for him, it's personal for the whole corporation. 
It's um, basically it's a criminal organization. And the first thing he did, he wasn't even president yet. In December 99, he was still prime minister. One of his first acts was to restore the memorial plaque to Yuri Andropov on Lubyanka Square in Moscow. This is the guy who set up the fifth directorate at the KGB to, uh, to punish dissenters. This is the guy who practiced uh, punitive psychiatry to put political prisoners in psychiatric hospitals. But by the way, this practice has returned once again with Mikhail Kasyanka in the Balotnik case. One of, his, uh, one of his first acts also as president was to restore the Stalin national anthem. These are not just symbolic things. This, this shows what kind of person this is. So I don't think there's any real possibility that this, you know, he himself had any inclination to go that way. That, and it's a totally different question is that they, they really are not that strong and they really are fearful. Hence all these uh, you know, military occupations of Moscow we mentioned whenever there's a big opposition rally. And if you recall, uh, the bigger, uh, you know, when suddenly we had those big mass protests in December 2011, which nobody expected, not us also, not just the regime. We were surprised by them too, weren't we? If somebody told me two weeks before Balotne that we'd have 100,000 people protesting against Putin on the streets of Moscow, I would, you know, I would say it's never going to happen. It happened. And you remember the regime, um, uh, rushing to concessions within days from the Balotne rally. Right? They returned governor's elections. They promised to register opposition parties. They eased restrictions to take part in elections. Of course, uh, after that, they, they played back and, and took these concessions back again. But uh, by their reaction, they show that they really are, they're not that difficult to defeat, really, when you have an organized force. And so that, that's also what makes me optimistic. I think when they're confronted with an organized civil society, finally, which is developing in our country, I think this, 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 the outcome will be clear. Yeah, thank you very much. And I have a privilege. So I think they were really British out of time. And that's why I think that I will allow myself a very, very brief, very brief statement of gratitude and acknowledgement of the great and wonderful role played by our friends and colleagues here during the forum. So I have to say that each time I hear the argument against Russia suggesting that, uh, that, that Russian people is not suitable for democ democracy or something, I find myself thinking, um, that in fact Peter Pomerantsev, Igor Pomerantsev's son, was absolutely right when he concluded that the argument that Russia is not tailor made for democracy is Russophobic. It's a Russophobic statement, as simple as that. Of course. And at the same time, I fully agree with Edward Luke, as a good friend of mine. And Edward told that uh, each time he hears something, uh, sort of, you know, insinuating against Russia as a nation. So each time he finds himself thinking that the best and the bravest people he has ever met were Russians. And I fully endorse this point of view. And I have to say that it would be very, very wise of us to remember uh, the war cry, the slogan, which was quite widespread in Lithuania in the late 80s and the early 90s, Zavashuk in national slogan, for your and our freedom. And with that, I would like to close the forum thanking our wonderful guests and speakers, Lydia, Andre, and Vladimir from the bottom of my heart. And on behalf of ISM, University of Management and Economics, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.